Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session at Marte Conference Global. Uh, I'm here with uh, Delaquest, and uh, he's going to talk to us uh, about audience management beyond opening rates. Uh, Delaquest was recently recognized as a 2022 email marketing thought leader by the ANA Email Experience Council. He's also spent over 20 years exclusively focused on building, improving, and occasionally disrupting the email industry. His passion extends beyond just improving email performance and customer engagement by analyzing huge quantities of data. He most recently has been a champion for the need to improve racial diversity throughout the industry from entry level to top leadership, starting at home with Alchemy Works. So Della, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, or thank you for having me. Um, it's very nice to be here, and I really appreciate those kind words. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen in a moment, and um, we can move on from there. Great. I think everybody can see my screen. Let me know if you can't, or um, just let that happen. So thank you very much. My name is Della Quist. I'm the CMO of Alchemy Works, and I'm going to talk to you about why we need to be up, move beyond the open rate when it comes to audience engagement. Um, it's kind of it's past its time. Things like iOS 15 have made a big difference into how we think about open rates, and in fact, how accurate they are. They still have a value. Don't get me wrong, and I will speak about open rates, but you actually have to think beyond that, and that's something that we've been doing for about two or three years now, and I think that this is a big, important development. Um, before I start, I'm going to tell you a bit more about myself. Um, I've been, as, as uh, the introduction says, I've been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, and, but you know what's fascinating about it is there's a general view that email doesn't change, right? It's very old fashioned, it's very boring, it doesn't change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, what, What's there, what's, there, what's there to worry about? And over the years, I mean, I think some things have been big problems for a very long time. Other things are just come and go problems. I mean, the one thing that everybody talks about is spam traps. Yeah, that's been, you know, people have been talking about that for 20 years. It's always a big concern for people. Um, another big one is what's the best subject line? You know, how do I improve my open rates? I, I, I need a good subject line. Um, that's another one that's been around almost forever. Um, more recent things that I think that up to a point we have got a lot better at than we used to be um, is personalization. So personalization has moved from, you know, hello, Della to, um, you know, more, more, if you like, more um, uh, deep content personalization and understanding what people want and making sure that the personalization carries a across the experience through all the channels. This is something that we're very heavily engaged in. It's very important. Um, the impact of iOS, that's one of the many short, sharp shocks that have come to the email marketing industry. Um, this was one, you know, uh, Gmail promo tabs is another one. I mean, it's endless how often curveballs are thrown at the industry and we have to respond to them. Video and email. Um, very big, uh, I, that's something that people have been asking about and we've got better and better at delivering it. And then of course, mobile. Um, and mobile moved from something everybody talked about, but kind of it was an a side thing to the stage where mobile first is pretty much where uh, uh, many, many people think. Um, there's a case for not going mobile first as well, but most people tend to view that this is, the, this is where we need to be. So, um, Bit about Alchemy Works really quickly. Uh, we're an agency that's been around for about 20 years and our goal is to work with platforms like Nautic to uh, help customers actually deliver a better experience to their customers. That's really what it is. Engagement drives revenue and we drive engagement. Um, and we're very focused and work with platforms and um, are very interested, you know, the more sophisticated the platform, the better it is for us because we're able to do a lot of stuff with that. Real quick, we've got about 125 active brands as customers and 
just by the numbers, average engagement, um, you can read this later, I won't go into too much, but we generally are able to increase people's uh, revenue by 80% when we first engage page social up. Um, we're able to reduce uh, SMS costs for uh, deployment and costs for, for deploying in-app stuff, uh, offices all over the world. Um, and also we have uh, about 200 people and the production team offshore and onshore. So that's pretty good for everybody. So enough with the about Alchemy Works um, and on to what audience management is. Um, audience management is something that I think most people who are concerned about overall engagement of their campaigns and their lists, you know, so why are people inactive? Why, why don't they like me anymore? Um, have I done anything wrong? If I did, what was it? If I haven't done anything wrong, am I doing it right? And how do I know about it? And there has been a tendency over the years to focus on audience management um, uh, um, from a customer lifecycle view, right? So that's basically it. So you look at the typical view of a customer lifecycle. Here are your high value customers. Here are your medium customers. And these are your not so good customers. It's fairly straightforward. Everybody understands that you kind of have a return and that return tapers off over time. And that thinking is typically extrapolated or pushed into the email channel. And they sort of go, well, look, look, you know what? In the first showing you here, you know, in these months, they were very, very engaged and now they're not so engaged. And so maybe I should stop mailing them. And, you know, because I don't want to annoy people who are not engaged with me. That's kind of the typical view. Um, the reality is slightly different as, you know, as I say, been analyzing data for many, many years. And the reality is slightly different when you look at how people uh, come back into the purchase cycle over a long period of time. So this here was looking, I mean, this is over five years worth of data. So what we did is we looked at the list and looked at the reservations uh, uh, per thousand customers by when they got on the list. And you will see these bumps here about once a year, makes sense, reservations, people go on holiday about once a year, and they visit family, or it could be Thanksgiving, or it could be Christmas, or it could be any holiday that you like. And people go away, birthdays, they go away at the same time. So what you see is that at this stage, they're very engaged. Now, they may or may not engage with your email campaign, but they're very engaged because they're in the process of making a purchase. Now, down here, they've just come back, and it's going to be a while before they buy again, right? And so it's very, very important uh, that they're less engaged. So uh, typically, the open rate from someone here is very different from the open rate from someone over there. The other thing you'll notice over time, and this is a, another part of what audience management does, is when you see these cycles and you start to manage those cycles, you don't just go, oh, look, this is very nice in historical data. You actually manage the cycles. You, therefore, the goal is to move these up. So the lows should be less low and the highs should be higher as you go down, right? So someone who's been on your list and you've been working with for five years, you want that to be up here right? And you want their engagement to move from down there up there as well. And that's basically what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, and that's the reality of lifecycle marketing. And what you will find is that at any given time, no matter how many segments you manage, at any given time, because of this dynamic movement of people between in purchase mode, not purchase mode, interested mode, not interested mode, what you'll find is they're moving in and out, interest and non-interest, engaged and unengaged. At, every single segment. So if you were to pick, I'll say two segments, engaged, unengaged, at the end of the day, there will be people in your unengaged segment who are now either becoming engaged or are engaged, but you haven't noticed it yet, especially if you stop mailing them. And then on the other side, you've got people who are engaged, who just bought, the product is happy, they're happy with it, they wrote a review for you, but they're not going to spend any money again for six months, 12 months, six weeks, three days, whatever the, the, the amount is. And so audience management is recognizing that. It's recognizing that they, you cannot have enough segments. You just cannot have enough segments. The more you have, the better. 
But at the end of the day, unless you approach the dynamic movement and tackle the dynamic movement between segments, you're probably going to be missing out. And one of the biggest reasons is that most blanket rules are, if you like, less effective than rules that have nuance, assuming that people understand them. Um, and the rule that came out that if someone doesn't open the email, it means they're not engaged and mailing them at all will annoy them. Now I'm going to invoke what I call do be smart. Don't just jump from not mailing someone to sending them three emails in a week and every day. Don't do that. That, that, would, that would not be smart. What I'm suggesting to is looking at what the meaning of unengaged is and what that time period should be and simultaneously reducing the risk of mailing someone who maybe hasn't opened an email and identifying behavior in other channels. That's kind of what it is. So the blanket rule actually is less effective than having a nuanced rule that actually goes longer in time. I would never, all things being equal, I would very rarely counsel that someone takes stops mailing someone after a year. I would be looking for 18 months or more. Now, that's not true for everyone. If you mail daily, that's a completely different situation altogether. But if you email two, three, four times a week, I would argue you could do that, especially if you focus on delivering good content. And that's the other thing about it. We always forget that we've spent a lot of money trying to an effort to create engaging experiences, and then we don't send them to people that might just open them. So what do we do instead? What we do instead is we focus on the very, very active. Um, almost all our tech, all our algorithms are there trying to identify the people who are already engaged. We're less good and able to identify people who are engaged but not opening an email. So the tendency is, and, and I've seen this a lot in most companies that I work with, there is a huge propensity for people well, let's put it this way. Who doesn't want the most active segment, right? So if you're a company with five stakeholders, all of whom want to mail folks and hit their number, they'll all want the same folks, right? Um, it's also true. Uh, uh, and, and, so, and if you look at AI or any technology, they'll spot the most likely and most active people very, very quickly. So what we're trying to do is reduce the burden on our best customers, right? I mean, here's the irony. A lot of people go, no one wants email. And then when they have a really good customer, they send them more of what they say no one wants. I actually think that most people are fairly comfortable with the email that they get. And, but I would like to widen the pool, widen the funnel from where it is, which is very narrowly focused on people who opened recently or engaged recently to people from a wider perspective than that. Um, so why would we do that? I mean, the reason we would do that is a reactivated email address is between two and a half and seven times more valuable than an inactive one. Um, how do we know this? We've run many, many tests and you get a control group and, and, and I'm talking about tests against inactives. You have to start by testing and I'll speak more to testing in a moment. You start with your inactive file and, and the people that you don't mail anymore, okay, um, or, or, or you're about to stop mailing and you take a group of them and stop mailing them completely. And then you take another group and continue mailing them. And between those two groups, you look at what happens in terms of people opening, clicking in an email, and then what their value is for the next quarter. So what, what, what the customer value is in terms of dollars for the next quarter, month, year, whatever it is. And that's where you see it. The people you stop mailing, if their representative value is $1, the people who you do mail will spend between $2.50 and $7 more, but very interestingly, even if they don't open the email. And that's one of the things that people, you know, are always surprised about. I, I mean, I'm personally surprised, you know, whenever I show clients, I have to sort of go, here you go. Here's the evidence that proves it. So for example, uh, the most recent case study that, that I have uh, at my fingertips, 
So people who didn't open and didn't get sent an email only spent $1. People who didn't open spent $4 and the people who did open spent seven. That's why you need to go beyond open rates when you're identifying who you're going to speak to and when. Um, that, that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. And this graphic actually explains really, really well why that's important. So I'll start here with, let's just assume you send out an email and you send it to your entire list. Anyone on the list can open the email. Well, duh, we got that, we've got the open, we're very happy, okay. But as you know, unless your open rate's 100% or more than 50%, more people will not open the email than do open the email. So what do they do? They could open it later, sometimes up to a week. I've seen people open an email that's a year old. They could visit the website. They saw a subject line saying great deals on web online today, and they go onto your website directly by typing in your URL and visit the website. They can go and visit the store, same thing. You're walking past the store and you go, ah, oh, there you go. There's a sale, I know that because of my email, and you go into the store. You could delete the email. And you know a lot of people worry about, oh, they just deleted the email. but it takes it takes your highest cognitive functions to delete an email. You don't just delete an email without knowing who it's from and what was in it in case it was valuable. And that split second, you use your highest brain capacity to analyze whether you should delete it or not means that the message is gone. It, you've got the message. Absolutely, you've got the message. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to unsubscribe or mark it as spam or ignore it or put it in a file. So. Whatever people do with email, one of the most unrecognized things about it is that they actually have to consciously understand what they got and from whom in a split second. And that's a very powerful opportunity. So let's say they do open, right? They could click or not click. And if they click, the same thing happens again. They could click later, they could visit the website, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are kind of invisible to you in the email channel. And if they do click and you get that, then they can go to the website and leave. They can abandon the cart. They can browse and buy. They can browse and buy in store. They can do all kinds of different things. But the point about it is apart from these two actions here, every one of these is difficult to see from your email program, which is why you have to focus on the customer and think across all the channels that you have at your available and give them two things. Uh, good experience across all the channels. So whichever messaging vehicle you use, you're using really a good customer experience and a, a uniform, unified experience across those channels. The second thing you're doing is you're just trying to pick up signals. So if someone does something in social media, brilliant. That tells you they're engaged, okay? And they're engaging with you. That would give you a view of the value of that person here as being closer to an opener or a clicker than a didn't open or a didn't click. Um, and it's true of all the channels around it. So you need to look beyond open rates. And that's what audience management is about. You're looking at your audience and you're not saying, in my email channel, I've got segment one engaged, segment two unengaged, and uh, if they're unengaged with one, I'm not gonna do anything with them, and if they're engaged, then I'm gonna focus because they love me. The answer is they're loving you here, and they're loving you here, and they're loving you here as well as everything else, and audience management is about saying, I'm gonna look beyond the lack of opens in the last six, nine, 12, 18 months, and look to, other places and pull that information back in. And that's what we're trying to do. So I wanna talk you through a bit of a case study. Um, you, you wouldn't expect me to, to, to sort of um, uh, speak to you about something like audience management without a case study, so I'm actually gonna fire away. Um, we work with Global Industrial um, who on a re-engagement campaign for them using audience, man audience management. Um, so, Really what happened is uh, for a number of reasons, acquisition budgets were cut. This was at the, at the time of the pandemic and it was one of the reasons why we presented the idea of audience management to them. Um, so they had budget cuts 
And our approach was to use it to re-engage people. And in a very, very short period of time, something like six months, we ended up where increasing the, the number of people who had engaged with them in the last six, 12 months by 70%. And we'd also lifted revenue by targeting email inactives identified as in, engaged elsewhere. And that increased the revenue of those people uh, by 200% over the control, which is, you know, fantastic numbers. And everybody would be happy with that, especially and including me. So how do we do it? So the next stage from, sorry, just give me a second. So what we did is we, we, we focused on Who's most likely to buy, right? They, they, like almost everybody at the time, have at least 50% of their mailable list uh, have not engaged for a while and are in a low volume. So we did an advanced customer uh, assessment, um, looked at their uh, integrating their existing customer models from offline and the web. Um, we put the goals between the business and the channel together. Um, co-segmentation, RFM, ongoing testing. We did all of that in order to engage, to identify and engage the people who looked inactive, but we could see from other channels as being most likely to buy. And in summary, this is kind of what it is. You want to move from, you want to shrink your unengaged file. You want to grow your engaged no purchase um, because those two things together grow your purchase increase in lifetime value. And that's basically what it is. You have new customers coming in. A lot of them will buy. Uh, will, uh, if some of them will not engage. A lot of them will engage. Some will buy. Some will not. So you're looking at the entire process. Um, so you're cutting off the flow or reducing the flow of people flowing into unengaged from your engaged file. And you're increasing the number of people who are new customers who actually stay engaged or make a purchase. And that's a critical part of what we try to do. Looking at time. Um, I mentioned to you about testing. In audience management, testing is absolutely critical. Um, and, you know, the approach we take and the approach I would recommend that you take is have a clear understanding of what tests give you the biggest lifts versus effort. And this is true, and you'll see. So audience management starts with reach and frequency. Reach is about identifying people that our existing methodology of open equals engaged don't see, and increasing that number. And if we can increase that number of people uh, by 70%, that's a huge, think of the lift that I said, if, if you can engage someone and get them to open an email, they move from $1 to up to $7 or between four and $7 in terms of value. Um, so we're increasing the reach and frequency very, in a very sophisticated way, in a very tactical way within the unengaged file, keeping it smaller, um, and also identifying people who are engaged a bit earlier, hopefully before the competition, if they're relying on, on subject lines. Uh, uh, sorry, if they're relying on, 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 on um, uh, you know, they're following the don't mail after X number of days, uh, they will lose out to you. Subject lines, notification timings, those are all really good. Course to action, offer, design. Design is absolutely critical, but it's actually hard work. So uh, some people interpret what I'm saying as design is too hard. No, actually, no, 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 no. It gives you a very good lift right when you've done everything else so if you apply the lift of design to your increased reach and frequency and your better subject lines and your better calls to action you will be doing a fantastic job if you have the resource to do it simultaneously absolutely that's fine because every new person that comes in will be influenced by your the customer experience they get and everything else so i it's very important to, to understand that design is about effort and if, if you were to ask me i would say typically focus, understand that design works better with a bigger list of people. That's basically what it is. In fact, everything works better with a bigger list of people, but that's another, they engage people, but that's another story. Um, so now something for you guys, uh, a, a little bit of a, um, a, a freebie. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, to thank you for, for, for listening to me and staying to the end if you did. 
Um, so we have an audience management lift calculator. Uh, it, there's a bitly thing there. I think you'll, we're recording the session and I'll send a PDF of the presentation so that it can be shared if you want it. Or you can email me. I've got my email address at the end of the presentation. Um, you just basically go to the calculator and you have to know kind of, you know, how, what your list size is, how many emails do you send a week or a month or whatever it is, whether you have what, what your open rate is and your click rate. And if you can do that, then the calculator will spit out a number and tell you um, uh, how well you could do. And then the other thing is, again, if you scan this QR code, you'll get this downloaded for PDF. The other thing we're doing is we're offering a free program analysis. So what we will do is you have to, it's a, it's a qualified response, but it's not, when I say it's qualified, you tell us a bit about your program and if you qualify based on you know the size of your list and how many emails you do and the size of your program then we will tell you whether it's actually worth using us or not if it's not worth using us then then, then uh, it, it, it's probably worth not doing this exercise um so we do a free program and analysis and we will uh take a look and we will do exactly what the calculator does um and we will provide you with a report based on that um, and you just scan the QR code down the PDF or if you can see this get in touch with us this way um, and thank you and any questions I don't think I've done too badly on time Deborah hey there uh, thank you Della. no you're you're three minutes early <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, I think there's a lot there uh, we could talk about. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, so uh, while people are maybe typing, uh, the first question that I have is about deliverability, because I think one of the main reasons why we have the no contact after nine months uh, rule is that we don't want to be caught in uh, spam traps or get blocked because we are, like you said, bothering people who don't want to, to receive our emails. So how do we deal with the deliverability issue? So I, I'm glad you asked that question because it's, 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 it's something that I think a lot of people might be curious about. And also it's a very clear application of my hashtag DBS rule, which is do be smart, right? So we'll start by saying you don't just take people you haven't mailed for a long time and just start mailing them, right? That would not be a smart thing to do. There's nothing in best practice or anything else that says that's a good idea. I'm also assuming that you're starting in a good place. I'm. This is not advice for someone with a deliverability problem, right? This is for someone who's got practices, all the deliverability best practice, DMARC, DKIM, SPF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, doesn't buy lists, you know, that's another thing that they don't do. They don't buy lists and they've got a business and most of the people they deal with are customers or people who have signed up for their program as prospects, right? So if you start with that, okay, and you didn't use the mail people after, I'll pick an, I'll, I'll say 18 months. I'm going to make it long so that people are a little bit shocked, right? And you didn't, mail them after 18 months of not opening. That's 18 months, that's a long time, right? What we start doing is we start analyzing your purchase cycle and looking how people behave just before or after they buy, do you get what I mean? And we start applying those sorts of timings to our email campaigns. Whether someone's opened or not doesn't really matter. Does that make sense? We know that this is about a year since they last bought and or six weeks if it's a product that you buy regularly. Do you see what I mean? So they must be engaged, right? They're busy. <laughs> they don't hate us. They're just busy. Okay. That's, that's, and they have a life. Um, and they take that, uh, you, you know, those are the people. If you have those sorts of customers and we identify them in another channel, either in social media or from app behavior or whatever it is, and we see that they're behaving in a way that someone is about to buy, we know that they will not be angry getting email, right? If they visited your website, and haven't bought from you for a long time. I haven't opened an email for 18 months, okay? And you send in a random browse email, right? Everyone expects that these days. They're not gonna go, oh my God, that's horrific, right? I'm unengaged. Everyone just kind of expects to get an abandoned browse, right? They expect to get an abandoned cart. They expect to get yada, yada, yada. And we're happy to send them those, right? No one says, oh my God, there's a deliverability problem with that. Have you ever heard anyone say that? No, they don't, right? 
So <laughs> we're just extending that into the email and saying, you know something, I think they would expect to get some offers. I think they would value some content at this moment in time because their behavior tells me they're going to buy, right? So again, to the point about spam traps, right? I'm not saying they don't exist. They do exist. But for a customer like I'm talking about, they shouldn't be a problem. And the reason is, is you're trying to attract people to give you the email address with your credit card, the one that you use for your credit card. Okay, because we want to sell you something or the one that's associated with your business. If you're a decision maker, right? That's the one we want. We don't want Mickey Mouse is an idiot at Google.com, right? We don't want that kind of email address. So our content and our behavior gets the correct email address. And if I say to you, how often have you changed the email address that you use for your banking? What would the answer be? I don't think ever. Me neither. There you go, right? So if I'm buying something, why would I use Mickey Mouse is a fool.com? Well, I, I wouldn't. I have to say, I have to get my order confirmation. So not all email addresses are the same. And by the same token, if you have a lot of people signing up Mickey Mouse is a fool on your website, you're doing something wrong somewhere else. And that's not the problem. You know, deliverability isn't that you mail that person, deliverability is that you either bought a list or your content is crap, or your offering is bad, and you they have no value. And so they just put you in the crap one. I, I told you that I get passionate about this question. Sorry about that. You can ask a supplementary as well if you want. <laughs> Uh, I was I was wondering like um, you mentioned at the beginning of the of the presentation that uh, if you are someone who's sending daily emails maybe the rules would be different and I, I got me thinking about uh, emails that are not necessarily offers or like not like uh, uh, e-commerce things but other sort of announcements like because one of the rules of the rules the the one on one blog posts and stuff like that you see a lot is like oh uh, nurture your 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 customer and you know keep your brand in mind so talk to them regularly uh what would you say like would be like a couple of tips if if you do have this tendency to email your customers more regularly and they still are not opening your emails is there any trick or anything you should you should be more attentive to in relation to how they might be engaging with your brand. So okay. you can and the, and, the, and the answer is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And audience management helps you understand that, right? Because what motivates someone who's engaged to open is very different from what motivates someone who hasn't opened in a long time to open, right? And so when most people, they'll do a subject line test and they'll test it on their best segment and go, oh, this is a, the best subject line for my engaged segment is going to be the best subject line for my unengaged segment. It's not, right? If it is, it's an occasional thing. More often than not, it's a different thing, right? So you have to test differently for those different segments. If I'm unengaged, I need to do a different test from the engaged and not just go, oh yeah, I tested on the engage, it was great, I'm running it, and look, they didn't respond. No, because you're making a mistake. The second thing is to understand that we're all driven by habit, and the brand is habit forming, right? So you're expected to be consistent in your brand messaging and your tone of voice and everything else in order to deliver that message, right? And in order to deliver that consistency so that people will recognize you in any situation and feel the way you want them to about it. So if you're focusing on, 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 on the brand side of it, sorry, I've, I've lost track. I, I, I got very excited about the brand thing because it's really important. We was like going on that. I asked you about like if you, you send more frequent emails. Yes, and still... so, correct. I, I was actually talking about getting people to open who haven't opened for a long time, right? So the point about it is the point about consistency is you become blind to consistency. If you see the same thing every day, if you see danger every day, you stop thinking danger. If you see free every day, you stop seeing free. If you see short subject lines every day, you stop seeing short. If you, right. And if I change it and send you a long one, it'll just make you go, oh, I haven't noticed that for a while. It's not that they didn't like you. It's just that they stopped seeing it because 
when they were engaged, the way you message didn't engage them. Do you see what I mean? And now they're blind. So you have to mix it up a bit. So mixing things up is a very important thing. And that includes like frequency. I'll bet you now, if you're a content provider and you have, and you're sending a, a daily newsletter update or a, a three times a week, you send a newsletter update to a B2B audience with content in it, right? And someone hasn't opened for 18 months. Change cadence. A good example of changing cadence is you go, oh, you know something, I'm going to find a reason to send them three emails in one day, right? <laughs> and that could be an offer to say you've got, you know, 30, 20, 10, something like that. That's a reason to mail someone three times. Or you could say a uh, special discount on this paid white paper. You know, we're going to uh, 12 hours to go, six hours to go, one hour to go, right? So if you can, and, and this is what I mean about do be smart, okay? If this was TV and you wanted to do run commercials all day, every day, you spend more on creative, don't you? You don't just do a crap ad that your, that your CEO recorded in his on Zoom, right? In his kitchen. You don't use that and put that a hundred thousand times. You create a story and an exciting picture and you, you target it differently. So it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing. Right. So that's how content works and mixing it up helps you with audience management, um, but also mixing it up in that sense. Changing frequency, everything else also means understanding. So if someone read an article about a particular conference, well, next year, send two on that conference. Right. If they downloaded a white paper on a particular subject, send them something that says, oh, we've got a new white paper. You just have to be smart about it. Um. The, the the other thing I wanted to ask you about was like, uh, do we need a agency to do all of that? Because uh, the tendency with Mautic is that we like to do things in house. So um, there, there seem to be a lot of steps towards identifying engagement in other channels and gathering this data, perhaps depending on the size of the business we're talking about. And um, so can we do this in house or do we need uh, in, outsider uh, and how do you say that and outsource to help us with that um how would well so first of all can you do it without an agency of course right you can recruit people without an agency uh <laughs> you can cook chinese food without going to a chinese restaurant right or or, or an asian restaurant you can you, you know, you can do all kinds of things. The question is, what does it make sense to do? Okay. And where do you want to put your effort? Uh, and one of the things that I like about open source CRM is I know that these are folks, I, I, companies that want to use open source typically have a very sort of technical way of thinking, right? You, you've got to be brave to go and pick up the tool and say, we can run with this. And do you see what I mean? And you're ignoring the safety blanket of something else and you want to do it yourself. So you've already got people who are good at that. The question is how many of them are marketers, right? So, so, and that's not to say they couldn't do it. Of course you can read all the books, follow me, you know, read the literature we put out, learn yourself, do it. You're an engineer. Is that what you want to do? If you want to become a marketer, I'd, I'd recommend becoming a marketer and that that's kind of, or you're a, an a analyst. So that's kind of the way I look at it is that, the parts we bring are staying on top of all the latest things. Do you see what I mean? So you don't have to do research on iOS 15 and the impact, right? You don't have to uh, do tests yourselves and then go and do some reading about what kind of tests you should do and everything. You work with an agency and you add to that source. We, we work very directly with in-house email marketing teams. You know, we can deliver strategy, uh, and you do the production, we can deliver production because the strategy you do it yourself, it's all the same thing, but you can do it yourself. There's no one there uh, that says you can't, but we all know, uh, and this is something that, that's also quite interesting, is email marketing is one of those jobs where it's actually quite hard to find people with experience at the moment. There's, there's wage inflation everywhere because of the economic situation, right? And it's actually quite hard to find people because email marketers have skills that are in true value and, you know, tremendous value, especially in difficult times. So, yeah, absolutely do it yourself um, and absolutely reach out and say, hey, I saw your presentation. You know, could you? I wanted to ask a question. I'd be happy to answer other questions. Uh, but 
it's it's just like yeah I, I love chinese food and sometimes i and i can cook it do you see what i mean but <clears throat> does that mean that i shouldn't go to a restaurant <clears throat> i see um and still have some time so um this is a more practical question but like uh what kind of uh, timeline are we looking at when we decide to go for a strategy like like that? Like between, regardless if it's in-house or with an agency, like between deciding to do that and gathering all this data and analyzing it and then starting to run a campaign to reactivate those, those inactive uh, folks, um, what kind of timeline are we looking at? Uh, great question. Uh, and it Again, so we know what we're doing, right? <laughs> and we've done it before. So our timeline is typically, we have certain things that we focus on, a, a bit more on the analytics stuff, very early in the process, you know, the first two, three, four weeks in order so that we can hit the ground running and get traction. That, that, that's an important part of it. Um, and then it, it's, it's really about what platform you're using and how quick it is to build out some of the programs and, you know, implement the additional journeys and all of that sort of stuff. So I would say that we are, we are able to show a, a significant return on investment within three to four months, right? So if, if we did an audit or you use the audit tool that I shared to look at whether you could make that additional money or not, uh, I would say we would have made significant inroads into that lift within 90 days. That's faster than I would have uh, anticipated. Well, yeah. I guess, but ah, I forgot the second part. The second part is what would it take to do it yourself, right? So you wouldn't necessarily know where you're looking. Okay. So if you were to say, what what would I what would it take me to do some research, think about it, look at my segments, think of what journeys I have that will work and journeys that I have that won't work. Do you see what I mean? These are all things we know already, okay. And you want to figure that out and also test into them. Do you see what I mean? Which test do you do first? Do you do the creative test? Do you do the this test? Or try all of them, see what works best, and then implement it that way. If you do that, I would say six to 12 months, if you know what you're doing, right? Or you have quite a small program. Anything complicated would probably take a bit more than that. So it, 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 it's the experience. It's sort of, uh, yeah, it's you're comparing how long it takes people to do it all day every day with versus someone who does email marketing all day every day but is needing to think and learn about something else so that that's probably what I, uh, about what i would say okay thank you very much uh we don't have any more questions let's shout out okay so i think i'll uh thank you and uh end the session thank you very much thank you all for being here and uh, Della, if you have the time, you'll be at the lounge now talking yeah. to people. Maybe we have some shy folks who want to just talk one on one with you. Yep. And thank you again for participating. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.